The previous episode mentioned that the skyscraper Victor painstakingly built was destroyed in an instant, and the radiation was about to spread, to survive. Everyone left the area by boat, except for Alicia who chose to stay behind, she believed she was infected with the virus and didn't have long to live. Unexpectedly, as her emotional burdens lifted, Alicia miraculously recovered. Instead of following the others, she decided to warn more people to leave. As for Morgan, he had set off earlier with his daughter to scout ahead and successfully found a place free of radiation. However, upon landing, little Morgan was abducted by a woman. Shockingly, this woman was Madison, who was supposed to be dead. Now, Madison is a collector for Padre, snatching other people's children to send them there. By the time Morgan found Madison, the child had already been taken away. During the confrontation, Morgan realized this woman was the mother Alicia and Nick spoke of. It was utterly unbelievable. You're Madison Clark. I don't know my name. The kids told me. Madison also learned from Morgan that her son Nick was dead and Alicia was probably in dire straits due to the virus, which left her in utter despair. Originally, Madison had betrayed her conscience to help Padre steal children for the sake of her son and daughter, but now she realized they were forever lost to her. To atone for her guilt, Madison decided to help Morgan retrieve his child. However, Padre was very cautious, and nearly all strangers they encountered ended up dead. So Madison suggested Morgan pretend to want to join them and provide false information about a raft at sea that might have children on it. This somewhat lowered Padre's guard, and they were taken aboard a yacht. After a journey, their eyes were blindfolded and they were taken directly to a large ship. Of course, this ship wasn't Padre's but merely a transfer station. Five hours later, Morgan was brought into a room and the hood was removed. It was dim, and Madison stood obediently to the side. Someone's voice spoke over the overhead speakers she said keeping them waiting for the last few hours they verified that the raft Morgan said was now handling the passengers. Morgan was shocked. This was just a lie to get here. Could it be Alicia and the others? He hurriedly asked how many people were on it. And thankfully, the person said there were few and indeed children. That meant it couldn't be Alicia and the others. The speaker then fell silent and the door opened. A woman with curly hair walked in. She looked very efficient. She placed a walkie-talkie on the table and the cry of a baby came from it, the latest child they had collected. The voice continued, We are very satisfied with your performance. Padre officially invited him to join them as a collector to bring more such children. Morgan didn't respond. His focus was entirely on the walkie-talkie because the baby's cry was very abnormal. What exactly had these people done? Considering his daughter might face the same fate. Morgan's anger flared instantly. <laughs> They knocked out all the guards. Madison told Morgan his daughter was in the next room and urged him to leave with her quickly. Madison planned to stay behind to cover their escape, considering it a form of atonement. But would things really go as smoothly as they hoped? Time flew by, and seven years had passed. Inside a Padre training ground, a zombie was dragged out of a cage. A man pressed the zombie's head against a pillar with a fierce hit, causing all its teeth to fall out. Then, he stuffed a clump of green moss into the zombie's mouth. This way, it wouldn't harm people. Opposite them stood an eight-year-old girl fully armed. Her name was Ren. Killing zombies was a compulsory course here. And today was her assessment day. Seeing Ren ready, the two men released the zombies. And then they ran out of the octagonal cage. Ren, wielding her stick, charged straight at it. Usually Ren's basic fighting skills are solid and he knocked down the zombies in three or two blows. Dub outside was a bit surprised. The zombies stood up and continued to stagger towards Ren. Looking at the zombies' hideous faces, Ren was in a bit of a trance. Visions of zombies accompanied by growling noises flooded her mind. Shadows of memories deeply etched in her psyche. In her moment of distraction, the zombie pounced on her, knocking her to the ground. The shadows in her mind intensified, seeming like a scene she had encountered before, frightening Ren into calling for Dove. <laughs> Dove was very dissatisfied with Ren's performance and questioned why she froze suddenly. Ren couldn't explain it but was determined not to give up, asking Dove for more training. What if I do your chores so you can study? For how long? A week. A month. Indeed, this was Padre. Their base was isolated by the sea, exuding a peaceful aura everywhere. Adults were responsible for daily necessities, while children were expected to learn exhaustively. The philosophy of Padre was to rebuild the world, and the children were the hope of the future. Admittedly, this ideology was quite advanced, 
That's also why they allowed collectors to snatch other people's children, they believed they were rescuing them, offering a better life only possible here. Ren had just finished her training and today it was her turn to deliver oxygen tanks. It was a simple task, just place them at the entrance of the basement corridor, but as she was arranging them, one of the tanks rolled down to the bottom floor, despite the darkness and her fear. Ren quickly went downstairs, eager to retrieve the item swiftly. As she picked up the oxygen tank, a hissing sound came from the distant corridor, seemingly from some device. With courage, Ren walked to the end of the hallway and saw a door, from which a woman's voice was coming. Kind-hearted and curious, Ren approached and opened the inspection window on the door. As the window opened, a rush of air hit her face. Ren peered inside, looking for the speaking woman, but only saw some simple living essentials. Is anyone in there? <laughs> wait, wait, please. I'm not gonna hurt you. This person was Madison, who, seven years ago, had set off with Morgan to rescue his daughter. She had been captured by Padre and imprisoned here for a full seven years. During this time, Padre provided oxygen to keep Madison alive and extracted a can of blood from her arm every week. For purposes unknown, as if she was a mere blood bank, Madison was fed up with this existence, seizing a moment of laxity from her captors. She grabbed a handgun and knelt on the ground, pointing it into her own mouth. She was so helpless, even the thought of dying was a luxury. After Ren emerged, she sought out Dove to inquire about the person locked in the basement. Why would such a thing happen in the seemingly benevolent Padre? Knowing that Ren had been down to the basement, Dove was angry and warned her to stay away from there, as that woman was extremely dangerous. Seven years ago, that woman had taken out more than a dozen guards with just a sledgehammer, and killing zombies was as easy for her as drinking water. Ren was surprised. Was that woman's combat ability really so formidable? Dove did not elaborate further but proceeded with the agreed-upon training. They sparred together, but Ren quickly discovered the flaws in Dove's techniques. A single sweeping leg move could defeat him. It seemed that to become stronger, she needed to learn from someone more powerful. So, Ren returned to the basement because Dove had said this woman was extremely terrifying in combat. Ren also brought a sledgehammer, hoping Madison would teach her how to kill zombies. Madison was somewhat stunned upon hearing this but didn't refuse. She agreed to teach Ren, but only if Ren would do her a favor, turn off the valve outside. Ren hesitated. That was the switch for the oxygen flow. The woman likely wanted to end her own life. Nevertheless, Ren agreed for the time being. Then Madison began instructing Ren on how to swing the sledgehammer. But the weapon was too heavy, and Ren couldn't quite grasp the technique. Madison had her pass the weapon through, intending to demonstrate herself. Without much thought, Ren handed the sledgehammer through, but Madison grabbed it and smashed the glass above her fiercely. Picking up a shard of glass from the floor, Madison slid it toward her own neck. Fortunately, Ren pushed the door open and prevented her. Suddenly, Madison noticed a mark on Ren's hand and urgently inquired about its origin. Madison had a suspicion and couldn't believe that seven years had passed. Shit! How old are you? Eight? It can't have been that long. Moreover, what puzzled Madison even more was why this child was still here. Without time to explain, Madison prepared to take Ren and leave, intending to hand the child over to her father as a form of accountability. By then, guards had arrived at the door. Madison pretended to take the child hostage. With fluid motions, she knocked down the guards and took their walkie-talkies and weapons. Where are you taking me? Where I thought your dad took you a long time ago. As far away from Padre as possible. By the next morning, Madison had stolen a boat and traveled a long distance down a river. After a while, the boat neared a shore, and the rest of the journey would have to be on foot. Ren was reluctant. She didn't want to meet the so-called father. Padre had once claimed that her parents were very selfish and had traded her for some food. Madison didn't care about these things. She had promised that man she would return the child to him. Then, they began to walk. On the way, Ren was very resistant suspecting that her so-called father might already be dead. She firmly believed that the ideological education given by Padre was correct. As they walked, a few zombies appeared in the distance. Ren, somewhat afraid, didn't notice the mud pit under her feet. Madison quickly ran up to help. However, Ren took the shovel and struck Madison on her back, also breaking the oxygen tank. Ren took Madison's walkie-talkie and ran back the way they came. Padre, can you hear me? This is Ren. Before Ren could say much, Madison caught up and snatched the walkie-talkie away. 
She didn't blame the child but noticed that her oxygen tube was now completely unusable. The handgun was still hanging in the mud pit, and with the zombies around, it was impossible to retrieve. Madison pulled Ren to go deeper, but Ren was stubborn, insisting on waiting for Padre's people to come and stating that she had been trained to survive and that a few zombies were nothing. Ren put on her mask, ready to challenge herself again, but as she looked at the zombies' ferocious faces, her breathing became rapid, and scenes from her dreams flashed in her mind, causing her to freeze. Madison timely dealt with the zombies and comforted Ren, telling her that it's normal to be afraid at only 8 years old. Ren didn't appreciate these words, she wouldn't admit she was scared. Madison didn't argue with Ren and prepared to continue moving forward as staying here would only attract more zombies. But as they were about to leave, a man's voice came. Who else could it be but Morgan? Who's that? It's your dad. Hearing this, Morgan also turned his head in surprise and looked at the child in front of him with disbelief. Madison curiously asked, didn't I cover your escape successfully seven years ago? Why did the child end up growing up in Padre? Morgan didn't say much, only indicating that he found this place by listening to the walkie-talkie. Ran looked at this uncle. Morgan was emotional. The baby that was so small seven years ago had grown so much. I am... Oh. Ren. My name is Ren. Morgan seemed to realize something and immediately sobered up. Then said to Ren, I don't know how Padre has described your parents to you, but it doesn't matter. I promise I will send you back to the island. Madison was completely confused. She brought her daughter to Morgan, yet he wanted to send Ren back. As zombies approached, Morgan had to take them to find a safe place. However, his attitude towards Madison wasn't so kind. He took away Madison's weapons and even threw away the walkie-talkie. After doing this, he took out his radio to contact Padre's people to come and pick up the child. And I had an idea where they would land. Madison realized Morgan had become a subordinate of Padre, and his code name was Nightingale. Madison asked again what had happened seven years ago. Morgan only told Madison that the child was better off with them. Isn't that what you told me when we first met? Madison was furious. She was a mother and knew what children wanted wasn't a life of wealth but family by their side. At that moment, more zombies approached, and they stopped their argument. You're doing it to make yourself feel better about all those other kids you took. The walkie-talkie mentioned Lark, which was Madison's code name. Negative. Just a fledgling. We no longer need Lark. Ren is fine and Lark is no longer a threat. I repeat. We no longer need Lark. She's become a liability to the settlement. And the implication was clear. They intended to eliminate this woman. Morgan thought for a while. Now that he was working for Padre, he had to obey their orders. He put away the walkie-talkie. Copy that. Not wanting the child to witness the scene, he asked Ren to wait for him in the distance. Then he took out his handgun, aiming it at Madison's head with heavy reluctance. Morgan didn't want to do this, but to send the child back, he had to go against his conscience. Ren, unable to bear it, looked back at the so-called father. After all, it was a human life at stake. Madison seized this opportunity, grabbed Morgan, and took away the weapon. The cunning of this woman hadn't diminished over the years. However, Madison stopped the child from returning because she didn't want Morgan to make the same mistake she did years ago. The presence of parents is the most important thing for children. Right. I want to go back. At that moment, seven or eight zombies approached. They couldn't stay there any longer and had to find a safe place. Gradually, it got darker and they entered a swamp. But the zombies were affected by the swamp and couldn't get close to them for a short period of time. Madison tried to convince Morgan to live a good life with the child and not to return to the cold place of Padre, but Morgan wouldn't listen. They provide a way of life that works. You really buy that bullshit, Morgan? You need to call me Nightingale in front of her. Morgan. What kind of name is that? It's your name too, kid. Obviously, Morgan didn't want to discuss it and they had to keep moving forward. However, they hadn't gone far before their argument resumed. Finally, Morgan couldn't bear it and raised his voice. Because when you found us, we were out of food, damn near out of water, and at the mercy of a posse. It's only a matter of time before things ended for us. Suddenly, a red flare lit up the sky. Someone had launched a signal flare. Padre's people must be nearby. They probably considered them fugitives due to their long silence. Morgan wanted Madison to hand over the walkie-talkie to clear up the misunderstanding. Unexpectedly, Madison threw the walkie-talkie into the water, completely severing Morgan's plan. We're gonna need that! I guess you can't take the easy way out now. We could die out here! Padre did that! That's how they're keeping her safe! Because you took her off the island! 
Morgan calmed down and led them forward. Staying would likely result in being mistakenly killed by Padre, and he knew of a safe place. By dawn, Morgan brought them to a location with a small house where he had rested seven years ago. Ren, following behind, felt an uncanny familiarity with the zombie-infested swamp. As she pondered, terrifying images from her memories resurfaced. Fortunately, Madison snapped her out of it. Kid, you okay? Did something happen to me here? Told you the less you know, the better. Then, they entered the house. Outside zombies hadn't noticed them much, and they would be safe as long as they kept quiet. Madison was already weak due to the lack of oxygen and kept coughing. Morgan, feeling compassionate, started checking her with the equipment. That's when he noticed the scars on Madison's arm, which were shockingly severe. He couldn't imagine what Padre's people had done to her. Morgan felt guilty. He didn't know Madison had been captured while covering for him. Today, he finally shared his own experiences. Over the past seven years, he indeed became a collector for Padre, but he only saw children who had lost parents or whose parents were willing to give them up for a better life. Though the world was falling apart, Morgan had always maintained his bottom line. He also told Madison that the raft Padre found at sea seven years ago was indeed his group of old friends. Only Daniel, Luciana, and Victor weren't there. The rest now lived on Padre's island. While they talked, Ren curiously inspected the house, with its graffiti and baby items. She guessed these things were related to her, but Morgan strongly denied it. He didn't want the little one to be associated with him. Ren opened a backpack and found a radio. She skillfully put on the headphones and turned it on. The music inside made her tremble with recognition. She knew the singer but couldn't remember who. Despite Morgan telling Ren it was just a song, she didn't believe it because this was the lullaby her mother sang to her in her cradle. As she listened, Ren started recalling some events from seven years ago, becoming increasingly agitated. Even pointing a gun at Madison, she blamed this woman for taking her away from the island. Seeing the situation worsening, Morgan immediately grabbed the gun. The gunshot echoed, attracting zombies outside, some of which had already climbed onto the wooden planks. The small cabin was leaking water and more zombies were approaching. The house would eventually collapse. Morgan made a quick decision to look at the door. This direction of the zombies is rarely a breakthrough. The man kicks open the door, swiftly planting his foot on the nearest zombie's head and then quickly dispatches another with a stick. They must leave before the zombies gather around. After Morgan ensures it's safe, he signals Madison that they need to hurry. Unexpectedly, after handing Ren down, Madison urges them to leave quickly, staying behind to draw the zombie's attention. Without hesitation, Morgan carries his daughter and heads towards the shore. Now is not the time for indecision. However, Morgan has no intention of fleeing. He places Ren on the ground at the shore and turns back to help Madison. Coincidentally, Ren's foot gets stuck in the mud, struggling in vain to free herself. As Morgan deals with one zombie, several more approach, leaving him no chance to reach Madison. Hearing Ren's cries, Morgan rushes over, but as zombies close in, he must first fight them off. Ren, seeing more zombies approaching from another direction, nearly 10 meters away, exerts all her strength but remains stuck. Morgan, unaware, is resolutely fending off zombies on his side. As the zombies got closer and closer, memories resurfaced in her mind. Doing this for you. You take care of her, right? Like you said, you take care of her. It turns out that seven years ago, Morgan successfully escaped from Padre with his daughter, and they have been living in that small cabin ever since. However, surrounded by zombies and with no other option, Morgan contacted Padre via walkie-talkie, who then took little Morgan away. That time, Morgan narrowly escaped death. Thus, Ren often recalls the zombie scenes, but only now does she remember that Morgan was protecting her. Contrary to Padre's claims that she was abandoned, as they're nearly overwhelmed, it's Madison. She's banging on the doorframe and shouting, drawing most zombies away, relieving Morgan's pressure, who then quickly frees Ren. Meanwhile, Madison, already suffering from lung issues and without oxygen, is weak and inevitably pulled down by the zombies. Ren struggles, witnessing someone sacrifice themselves for her for the first time. We did the same thing! Because your boat was being pulled under by the walkers! No, please! Madison, resigned and without family in this world, believes an early end might be better. Suddenly, gunshots ring out as a speedboat rushes in. 
killing the zombies close to Madison with its superior marksmanship. It was Grace, Grace, who overheard the conversation on the walkie-talkie, rushed here as fast as possible. Noticing Ren, Grace is momentarily stunned. In the end, they escape to safety. Half an hour later, they find a safe spot to rest. Morgan and his wife feel downcast, unsure how to face the child they haven't raised. Madison breaks the silence, asking if Grace has also joined Padre. Grace doesn't deny it but clarifies she's not a collector. Instead, she's responsible for maintaining the area's radio equipment for Padre. Madison is disheartened, wondering why everyone is jumping into the fire. Ren, beside her, didn't bring up going back to Padre again, because she recognized the voice of Grace as the one from the recorder, the same one she heard in her cradle as a child. That voice belonged to her mother, but Grace didn't show the concern a mother should. Instead, she urged Ren to forget these matters. If their relationship became too close, who knows what Padre would do? Yet, Ren expressed her desire not to return to the small island, she wanted her parents to take her somewhere else to live. She had understood that Morgan wasn't trading children for food as Padre had told her, but seven years ago, her father had given her a way out of necessity to keep himself alive. And when Grace had saved them, Ren felt the protection of her parents for the first time. Before Ren could finish, Morgan sternly reprimanded. Don't you see what happened today? How can you grow up safely with us? Ren, still indifferent, said, You don't need to make tough decisions to protect me. I like living with you. As she spoke, she turned and beckoned Madison to leave with her, to live on, supporting each other. As Ren was fantasizing, the sound of a yacht came from afar. It must be Padre's man. Grace and Morgan had already radioed their location. They still didn't want Ren to suffer with them. At Padre, it would be different. It's safe there, with no worries about living. Ren was very angry. They hadn't consulted her before making this decision out of love. You have to forget everything that happened back at the boat. You're my parents. No, we're not. Okay, we're not. We're not your parents. Your parents were Isaac and Rachel, and they're dead. He died a long time ago, and they made me promise to take care of you. And that is what I'm doing. These words hurt Ren deeply, making her feel like a burden that could be abandoned at any time. Madison looked at Morgan. How could he hurt a child so much? She knew nothing was more important than being with one's children. Madison decided not to run away. If Padre wanted to kill her, so be it. Soon enough three boats arrive and the first thing they do is grab Madison and Ren is taken away by the yacht. The couple looked on helplessly. Morgan could only comfort. She's alive. That's good. At least we saw her today. After everyone left, Shrike told Morgan he was no longer fit to be a collector, as this incident almost cost their investment in Ren. Despite Morgan's assurances, Shrike didn't listen and had him taken away. Take him away! Back on the small island, Ren was first taken into a secret room. A voice from the speaker kept asking questions, seemingly to confirm her loyalty to Padre. But Ren was clever. She understood their intention and answered flawlessly, expressing her willingness to sacrifice everything for Padre. After coming out, Ren even sought Dove to apologize for her actions, continuously stating how fortunate she was to stay in Padre after witnessing the cruelty of the outside world. It's not hard to guess Ren's intentions. Morgan and Grace were protecting Ren in their way, and she wanted to protect them similarly. The reason was simple. If Ren showed any attachment to Morgan and Grace or dissatisfaction with Padre, her parents would suffer. This trip also resolved Ren's fears. She no longer feared the terrible memories in her mind. She knew her father had protected her unconditionally seven years ago, and that she was loved and guarded. Thinking about this, Ren is no longer afraid of anything and has done what she could not do before. The people around her were impressed. Even they couldn't do that. The audience might think the eighth season's plot is mundane, but on the contrary, this episode is laying the groundwork for the later story. The real climax will come with the appearance of the protagonist group. A zombie was wandering in the woods, occasionally letting out a hiss. Suddenly, the person who killed the zombie was Naomi, who hadn't appeared for a long time. Seven years had left some traces of time on her face. After disposing of the zombies, Naomi continues on, setting up signs in the trees that read, Turn around and leave. Padre will take your children. Naomi's purpose was to warn survivors that Padre is a lie and to stay away from this area, especially if they have children. This raises questions among some viewers about how Naomi is again connected to Padre. Here's a timeline. Seven years ago, they left the radiation zone on a small boat and drifted at sea for a long time. At that time, Morgan had gone ahead to scout and tried to find a place called Padre, thinking it might be a good refuge. But unexpectedly, 
Just upon landing, his daughter was taken away by Padre's collector, Madison. Later, it became clear that this organization was actively searching for children or pregnant women to get his daughter back. Morgan pretended to want to join them and offered information as a condition, but what he never expected was that Padre would search the sea right away and indeed discover a fleet of boats, which indeed had pregnant women on board. We found the raft you told us about. We're processing the passengers now. Yes, they found the very group drifting at sea, including Naomi and others, and they were all kept to work at Padre. At that time, the found fleet didn't include Daniel, Luciana, and Victor. They must have been separated from the others. So, they lived on the small island for six years, but Naomi chose to escape. Naomi hid around Padre, posting these warnings everywhere to remind people to stay away from this area. But today, Naomi noticed a strange phenomenon. Someone had written under her sign, They took my daughter, help me. Naomi sighed, quickly scanned her surroundings, and saw no one. Then, a voice came from the radio. It was the collector's conversation. Ten minutes out. Got a lead on an egg. Naomi had been monitoring this channel. Using binoculars, she looked toward the distance. A motorboat was approaching on the calm lake. The collectors. A flash of cold light in her eyes. She quickly took out two tranquilizer darts and a dart gun. Aiming. Besides posting warnings, her days consisted of sniping these bastards. True to her reputation as sharpshooter John's wife. She easily handled them with just two shots. The two collectors weren't dead, just tranquilized. Naomi dragged their boat ashore and then removed the syringes. She tied back her loose hair and took out a set of tools, placing one collector's hand on the edge of the boat. She applied alcohol at the base and injected an anesthetic. Many may have forgotten that Naomi was once a very outstanding nurse. Next, a tourniquet was placed on the collector's finger to stop the blood flow. She cut open the flesh and then sawed through the bone with a saw. Finally, Naomi politely used a blowtorch to cauterize the wound on the collector's finger. After doing all this, she pushed the two men back into the lake as if nothing had happened. After a while, Naomi returned to her secluded cabin, which was generally impossible to find. She opened a hidden floor cabinet and threw the two collector's handguns into it. Then she took out a glass jar, filled with fingers. Meanwhile, a hysterical roar came through the walkie-talkie. The two collectors who had just woken up realized their fingers were missing and were reporting it to their superiors. Judging by the number of fingers in guns and glass bottles, Naomi had done this countless times. The next day, Naomi went out as usual, but when she got to the sign, she noticed an additional line written on it. It read, Who are you? And how can I find you? Naomi instantly became tense and scanned her surroundings, but she saw no one. Soon, the walkie-talkie buzzed again. The collectors had found another child and were preparing to seize them. Naomi didn't linger and hurried towards the location the collectors had mentioned. Three hours later, Naomi returned with two more fingers, skillfully dropping them into the jar. Suddenly, a voice came from outside, and a man walked in. The man explained, I followed you secretly and am the one who left the message on your sign. My name is Adrian, and I desperately need your help. I don't want to know your name. I need your help. I can't help you. For my daughter. Hannah. Don't know her. It turned out Adrian had a daughter named Hannah, who was taken by the collectors five years ago. He saw the warning signs outside and knew that the person who wrote them must have some understanding of Padre. So Adrian wanted Naomi to help him retrieve his daughter. Adrian thought Naomi didn't trust him, so he pulled out a photo of his daughter Hannah, taken when she was seven. She was seven when this picture was taken. She'd be 12 now. That bracelet. She made one for each of us. Naomi glanced at the photo and the matching bracelets. This was indeed a father who had lost his child. More importantly, Naomi had seen this little girl at Padre, but she still coldly stated, I said I can't help you. Adrian didn't want to give up. He slowly put down the photo and said, I'll come here every day, and there are many like-minded people outside. Many are parents who have lost their children. We're assembling an army to fight against Padre, hoping you can join us and provide some useful information. I see you. Adrian had no choice but to leave the room. Naomi leaned against the door, lost in thought, her expression showing pain and sorrow. She just wanted to stay away from everyone and quietly remind them to stay away from Padre, but now someone had sought her out. After much thought, Naomi decided to leave the area. She packed all her weapons, tools, 
and the jar of fingers into her backpack and, under the cover of night, stepped out of the house. However, leaving this place would surely require a boat, so she prepared for one last job. This time, there were three collectors on the boat, but for Naomi, it was just a matter of one more shot. In the previous episode, Naomi decided to find a boat and leave the area, planning one last job. She skillfully dragged three collectors ashore. Unfortunately, one of the collectors had an unlucky plunge into the water when hit by the tranquilizer and had to be pulled up tight to the side of the boat. But upon inspection, he was already breathless. Naomi felt no guilt over this. Collectors weren't exactly saints, and she mercifully sent the man on his last journey. Naomi opened her tools, preparing to cut off the fingers of the remaining two men as usual. But just as she was about to begin, Naomi suddenly noticed a familiar scar on the face of one collector. Pulling down the mask revealed a burned face, it was Dwight. Naomi seemed to realize something and uncovered the other collector's mask. How could it be them? Suddenly, a child pointed a rifle at her. Didn't know there were kids on board. Where did you go? I hid under the tarp when you shot him. And you put the gun down. I'm telling Padre what you did. In the boy's mind, Padre was paramount, and he intended to relay the information back. Our boat got attacked. Vince, where's Whistler? Dead. She killed him. The Red Kite and Starling? She knocked them out. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sherry and Dwight were gradually waking up, though still groggy. Before Finch could reveal his location, Naomi acted swiftly. She managed to grab the walkie-talkie, but the yacht was damaged. Naomi cursed as the boat she had finally secured was now ruined. As Dwight and Sherry became more aware, they immediately guessed Naomi must be the one who had been ambushing collectors. Dwight snatched the tools from her. As an old friend, he naturally wouldn't betray Naomi. He didn't want Naomi to continue such acts. If discovered, the consequences would be dire. Naomi, wanting no contact with others, prepared to leave to find another boat. But Dwight stopped her, saying the child had appendicitis and needed her help to perform surgery. I don't have what I need in my kit to do an appendectomy. Well, you need to figure it out. Why is that? Because if you don't, I'm going to tell Padre who's been cutting off all his collector's fingers. I just wanted to leave. Why? Because it's not safe for me here anymore. <laughs> Sherry approached Finch, telling him to wait over there. Naomi looked at Sherry's gentle eyes, seemingly guessing something. Remember what I taught you. You see, Carrion? Aim for the eyes. As Finch walked away, the couple again inquired about what had happened to Naomi, sensing she had changed, seeing Naomi's reluctance to speak. Sherry proposed, how about this, we'll help you find a boat after the surgery, and you can go wherever you want. Padre won't know anything about you. Naomi realized their intense concern for the child meant only one thing. That's your kid, isn't it? The one you were pregnant with when they found us on the rafts. The husband and wife looked at each other and didn't say anything, which is considered to be tacit acceptance. At Padre, it was almost impossible for families to meet. Everyone was assigned to work in different places. Children were even told they were abandoned by their biological parents to facilitate brainwashing. Dwight, responsible for teaching children combat skills at Padre, guarded his son in this way. Of course, Padre didn't know he was the boy's father. Even Finch himself thought he was an orphan abandoned by his parents. Dwight and Sherry had bribed some contacts to secretly reunite and take their son out. Their goal was to find Naomi to treat Finch's appendicitis, then quietly return him without anyone noticing. Naomi no longer refused. After all, it was her old friend's son. She indeed knew a place where they could perform the surgery but insisted they promise not to ask questions about anything they saw there and to leave immediately after the operation. Come on, let's go. At night, they arrived at an open field with a train parked in the middle. The place Naomi said was suitable for surgery was here. Arriving at the door of one carriage, Naomi first knocked on the door frame. No zombies appeared, so they entered. Inside, the place was cluttered, but all the necessary medical equipment was present. However, the place was somewhat eerie. Dwight and Sherry wondered how Naomi had found this place. Moreover, a zombie's head was clamped in the air on an operating table, groaning. Sure, this place is safe, Jim. Naomi didn't answer but calmly plunged a dagger into the zombie's head. She turned on the power, and suddenly the entire workshop's equipment came to life. After some preparation, 
the surgery was about to begin. Finch was a bit nervous, and the couple quickly comforted him, urging him not to overthink. Dwight had even prepared a gift, unable to reveal his identity as the father, but at least he could be by Finch's side. As Sherry went to fetch equipment, she inadvertently saw a medical record filled with dense text and images. The people in the pictures were in a sorry state, with wounds all oozing with pus. When she thought about Naomi's weirdness, she couldn't let her son be treated so easily until she knew what was going on here. Naomi felt somewhat guilty but still said it was them who had asked her to perform the surgery, and they had promised not to ask questions. While they were talking, there was a noise at the door. Adrian, the man with a gun, had followed them and walked in, thinking they were up to no good when he saw Finch on the bed. Naomi quickly explained it wasn't what he thought. My daughter Hannah. Padre's got her. One of you knows where she is and you're gonna tell me. She's right. Look, this does not have to end in a fight. Okay, I'm sure, I'm sure your daughter's fine. Padre hasn't lost a kid yet. And I teach them how to protect themselves. So if you tell me what she looks like and we can figure something out here. Adrian, your location. Please respond. Dwight acted fast, snatching the gun away. The gunshot led to a power outage in the carriage and the noise attracted nearby zombies. Inside the car, Dwight takes the initiative and crushes the intercom with his foot. With the power out, a smooth surgery was impossible. Naomi mentioned an emergency backup system in the last carriage that could restore power. With his son lying on the bed in pain, Dwight told his wife to keep an eye on Adrian with the gun while he prepared to cross the train. But as Dwight reached the door, Naomi blocked him, saying the path was impassable. It's full of the dead. Damn it, June, just tell us what happened here. I used to work here. She then revealed the truth. Seven years ago, after being taken to Padre, she was forced to work here on a secret operation unknown to the outside world. Padre was conducting human experiments here, attempting to use radiation therapy principles to treat zombie bites. The pictures Sherry saw were so horrifying because the people exposed to radiation suffered immensely, far worse than death by zombies. Naomi was coerced into using those people as guinea pigs, and she couldn't bear it, eventually escaping Padre. That's why she had been posting warnings for a year, urging people to stay away as they were still reeling from shock. Finch cried out again in pain, the priority now was to turn on the power, but the exterior was swarming with zombies, making it impossible to bypass. Eventually, Dwight thought of a way to reach the last carriage via the train roof. Ten minutes later, they've completed their mission, turned on the emergency power, and are now heading back the way they came, but Sherry seemed preoccupied, contemplating something. She turned and said, after so many years, I finally hear you call me dear again, and I saw our son. It feels really good. Sherry wasn't satisfied with just this, especially after seeing what Padre was researching. She no longer felt comfortable with her son living in such a place, and the situation felt so strange. Having their child close yet unable to acknowledge him, telling him he was abandoned by his parents. So, Sherry suggested they leave Padre, the three of them finding a place to live peacefully until they could expose Padre's true face. Dwight was momentarily stunned. Seven years of routine had made it hard for him to adapt, and escaping meant facing pursuit. But he loved Sherry and would unconditionally support her decision. In that moment, they seemed to truly find themselves, and the weight that had been on their hearts for seven years quietly dissipated. But as they were kissing and engrossed in each other, a creaking sound came from beneath their feet. Suddenly, <laughs> Naomi also heard the loud noise and quickly took out her walkie-talkie to inquire what had happened. They couldn't answer in time because they were surrounded by zombies. Dwight also reacted quickly, immediately using his pistol to shoot at the zombies. However, there were too many of them, and without melee weapons, they could only temporarily climb up the luggage racks to avoid them, but their bullets were limited. And after a few shots, they ran out, making it impossible to escape. Naomi told them to stay put while she went to rescue them. Dwight urgently told her not to worry about them because Finch still needed her to perform surgery on him. If they didn't survive, he made her promise to take care of his son. Naomi looked back at the child and made a decisive decision. Adrian, standing nearby, didn't understand why she would risk it, but Naomi firmly stated that it was precisely for the child that they, as parents, must survive. After saying this, Naomi resolutely opened the train car door, fully aware of what was inside from their previous experiments. The car was filled with formaldehyde-soaked heads and zombies that had undergone radiation treatment, all locked up for observation and study. It was unimaginable to think of the inhumane experiments conducted by the leaders of Padre. These zombies, due to radiation, had lost all their hair and had pus-filled sores on their skin. Naomi looked at them and felt guilty. 
That's why she didn't want to be in contact with people anymore, even though she was forced to do it. She couldn't get over it. Naomi accelerated her pace to get out of the carriage as soon as possible. But unexpectedly, the door was locked and she couldn't open it no matter what she tried. Meanwhile, the zombies behind her were pulling at the pipes, making a racket. She became anxious and quickened her efforts. As Naomi feared, the zombies had broken free from their chains and were approaching her. Unable to open the cursed lock, Naomi had no choice but to confront the zombies, pulling out her pistol and facing them head on. <laughs> But while dealing with the third zombie, she was knocked down due to the close distance, and her pistol fell out of reach. As she struggled to get up, more zombies closed in. Naomi had to use her feet to hold them off. But this was no solution. Just then, she heard noises from the direction she came from. Adrian had followed after some contemplation. Adrian, not a bad person, was seeking Naomi only for information to rescue his daughter. He had never harmed anyone. Seizing the opportunity, Adrian once again invited Naomi to join his group to overthrow Padre along with other parents who had lost their children. Naomi, afraid to face certain truths, once again refused. Meanwhile, Finch, armed and ready to contribute, followed. It's too dangerous, you need to go back. I can handle the carrion. Red Kite taught me how. Red Kite was his mentor. After all, Dwight and Sherry were lying on the luggage rack, surrounded by zombies below. Just then, Gunshots rang out as Naomi and the others arrived. Fortunately, with coordinated teamwork, they quickly cleared out the zombies. I'm gonna tell Padre how I fought the carrion. At this moment, Sherry felt a tinge of sadness. The child was always thinking about Padre. He had been brainwashed too deeply. Dwight and Sherry exchanged a glance. And, as previously agreed upon, they decided to tell Finch the truth. Where were your parents? No, you're not. No. No. Yeah, I, sweetie, I know this is a lot for you to take in right now. Finch hadn't yet recovered from the shock of the truth when his wound began to hurt again. Now, the only option was to return to the operating room to complete the surgery. Just as they turned to walk back, Adrian heard something. It was as if he had a premonition. He looked toward the door of the train carriage. That glance sent a chill through his body and shook his soul, because the small figure behind them was his daughter, Hannah whom he had longed for day and night. Hannah had evidently become one of the zombies. Naomi also looked on sadly. Or was it discovered? Adrian suddenly flew into a rage, grabbing Naomi's collar and shouting, You knew all along, didn't you? With sorrow, Naomi replied, When Hannah first arrived at Padre, I treated her asthma. She was terrified and missed her father. Hannah also reminded me of my own daughter. I wanted to take care of her, to make her feel safe. One time, when Hannah was out for training, she was bitten by zombies. The wound was on her back, and I couldn't amputate it. But I had to do something to save her. With that, Naomi revealed another shocking secret. It turned out that the human experiments had not initially been proposed by Padre, but by her. Because Naomi had once seen Alicia infected with the zombie virus and still surviving despite exposure to radiation, she believed that radiation might save the child. You did this to her? I gave her radiotherapy! With equipment that we scavenged from a hospital, it stopped the infection. But the amount of radiation that it took just made things worse for her. And I wanted to end her suffering. So why didn't you? Because Shrike wouldn't let me. She wanted to let her turn so she could study her. Initially, Naomi just wanted to save people and did indeed stop the infection. But later, when Shrike found out, she forced Naomi to continue her research at gunpoint. Completely disregarding the patient's suffering, Naomi realized that the experiments would only stop if she fled. So she left Padre. However, before Naomi escaped, she anesthetized Shrike and cut off her index finger so that she could no longer pull the trigger to force anyone. Even later, Naomi used the same method to ambush the collectors outside, cutting off their index fingers so they couldn't use guns to threaten the parents. After hearing everything, Adrian's world collapsed. He couldn't blame Naomi, he even had to thank her for taking care of his daughter. Adrian only hated himself for not saving his daughter earlier and letting Hannah suffer so much. She was all I had left. I understand now why you want to be alone. After saying this, Adrian resolutely walked toward the door. The three people behind him watched quietly and sadly. 
They were all parents or had been parents. They could understand Adrian's pain at that moment. Sherry and Dwight became even more determined to take the child and leave. The blood bond, the family connection, is indeed a very sacred and mysterious thing. With just one glance, Adrian could recognize his daughter. After five years of separation, Adrian's daughter had become a zombie. Even though Hannah was completely unrecognizable, Adrian identified her instantly. With a heart full of pain, Adrian looked at his daughter and then opened the door. Adrian! Adrian, no! He reached out to embrace Hannah, utterly disregarding his own safety. Because this was his daughter, his treasure, what did it matter if he was attacked? The four onlookers were heavy-hearted. In such a situation, they could neither intervene nor stop it. Three hours later, Naomi stitched up Finch's wound. Finch's surgery was a success. All they needed now was to wait for the child to wake up. After these events, Dwight and his wife had decided not to return to Padre. They were preparing to escape with their child and lead a good life. Additionally, they invited Naomi to leave with them. No, we agreed. When Finch wakes up, we're gonna take him away from this place. Yeah, we're, we're gonna try and be a family. What's that got to do with me? Your family. <laughs> Dwight earnestly said, you now have no attachments and are filled with guilt. We're genuinely afraid that one day you'll feel life is meaningless. And do you remember, if it weren't for you and John, I might still be a fugitive, possibly dead in some corner. You saved me, and because of that, I found my sherry and now have a family. If you're willing, I hope you can become a member of our family. After a long silence, Naomi finally gave her answer, but before she left, she had to give Adrian and his daughter a ride to help them out. With that, Naomi turned and walked toward the interior of the carriage, but the carriage door burst open with a bang, and several collectors rushed in, clearly surrounding them. A woman slowly walked in. It was Shrike. Hello, Blue Jay? When Naomi woke up again, Shrike's face came into view. How did you find me? I figured it was you as soon as the collectors started showing up to the island without... Speaking, Shrike also raised her hand, on which conspicuously lacked an index finger. Only Naomi could have done such a precise act. Shrike had learned of a child needing surgery and had thus easily found them. Then Shrike went on a lengthy tirade, claiming this carriage carried the future hope of humanity and insisting Padre had never killed anyone but was saving lives. This woman had completely lost her mind. Padre. You're full of shit. You're the one who lied to Padre about what you were doing today. No, I brought Finch here to keep him safe from assholes like you. No one wants these children safe more than Padre. That is why this place is so important. But Blue Jay ran off before she could perfect the cure. Cure? When we tried it on, died. Subsequently, Shrike again forced Naomi to continue the unfinished research. Naomi said she would not continue even if she had to die, but she underestimated Shrike's madness. Shrike had her subordinates bring in a head it was Adrian's, who had now become a zombie. The collectors placed it in a clamp. Dwight and his wife seemed to sense something and stood up tensely, just as they had feared. The group brought the zombie head close to Finch. Please don't. Oh, please stop it! Finch, wait, come in! Stop. Shrike lifted the remote control and pressed the switch, slowly moving the head towards the child. Her aim was simple, if Finch was bitten, Naomi would have to use her research to treat him, or else watch Finch turn into a zombie and die. Eventually, the zombie's head bit into Finch's shoulder, and blood immediately began to flow. Seeing that it was enough, Shrike pressed the button to lift the head. I'm gonna kill you. Why would you do that? I am the only one who could save his life. Get them out of here. <laughs> The wound in this location couldn't be amputated. Shrike urged Naomi to act quickly as Finch couldn't wait too long. Moreover, many more injured were being transported here. However, before the treatment, Shrike had one more important thing to do. Two collectors held Naomi down, placing her index finger on the chopping board, then brought out her surgical knife. <laughs> Regarding Shrike's claim that many patients were on their way, in reality, they were all people they considered useless, and in this transport vehicle were two such people, namely Morgan and Madison, they were unaware of their fate. On the road, Madison asked Morgan why he felt he couldn't protect little Morgan, what exactly had happened. Morgan also expressed that he was once a lost person, because he was too much of a saint. He messed up every time, and those around him never ended well. 
Madison quickly responded, saying he should change and do what he wanted. As she spoke, Madison began to feel unwell and had difficulty breathing, the oxygen in the box was locked. So Morgan had to shout loudly, asking the driver to stop immediately. The transport was handled by a man and a woman, hearing the shout. They quickly opened the door to help Madison and get some oxygen, but suddenly, Madison bit her teeth and charged, knocking the two guards to the ground. Morgan, go! Go! Morgan took the opportunity to escape. Here, let me explain the character of Naomi. When Naomi first met John in the original series, she used a fake name. Naomi's real name is June, but for the sake of the audience's confusion, Naomi was used instead. Stop, please stop! I meant I don't stop, please stop. To force Naomi to participate in the research, Shrike shockingly used Dwight's son as a test subject. Fortunately, three days later, the child's radiation treatment was successful, and the viral infection was indeed contained. So Finch was taken back to Padre. Finch wanted to ask where his parents were, but the voice over the speaker informed him. Many viewers were curious about who the person speaking in this small room was. In fact, if you observe carefully, the child is facing a mirror. The mysterious speaker is behind it, and his name is Padre. The organization is also named after him. Strangely, the children on the island had been taught from a young age that everything they had was given by Padre, yet no one had ever seen what he looked like. Madison helped Morgan escape, but she was captured. When she opened her eyes, the sight in front of her startled her. A burlap sack was hanging in the air, emitting zombie noises. Madison struggled only to find she was firmly tied to the surgical bed. A truly eerie situation. Then, the door made a sound. When Madison looked over, she was stunned. The person who came in was Naomi, who had a finger cut off. Naomi? It was a long time ago. They hadn't seen each other for 10 years and had thought the other was long dead. After the initial shock, Madison calmed down. Given her current situation, she suspected Naomi might be in league with Padre. Moreover, as a nurse, it was very likely Naomi had been the one letting Padre draw her blood for years. Naomi quickly shook her head, explaining, I always thought you had died in that big fire years ago. I can't believe you're still alive. As for them drawing your blood, I think it's because I told them about your daughter seven years ago. Alicia was bitten by a zombie and survived for a long time. Apart from the radiation factor, they guessed it might be due to hereditary reasons, so they used your blood for research. Realizing the truth, Madison understood. And from what Naomi said, she now had no value other than being used as a test subject for experimental drugs. Knowing her time was short, Madison asked Naomi for a favor. There was a file in Padre documenting the children she had taken as a collector. If possible, she wanted Naomi to help return these children to their parents. As they were talking, two guards received a message from Shrike asking if they were ready. Naomi nodded in cooperation, signaling that the experiment was about to begin. She turned to Madison, saying, Don't worry, ten years ago, you threw yourself into the stadium and saved all of us. This time, I'll be with you until the end. The child recovered from radiation treatment, and you can survive this too. Soon, Shrike arrived and lifted the burlap sack. After everything Padre gave you, you betrayed him. This is how you're gonna make it up to him. As she did so, Shrike slowly pressed the zombie head down, claiming righteously that this wasn't personal vengeance but merely for the continuation of Padre. Meanwhile, not far from the train, two figures appeared. Ren and Dove. Today was the day they were leaving the island for training. Taking this opportunity, Ren brought Dove here to show her some truths about Padre, but there were guards near the train. So Ren knocked on the rail with a hammer, planning to lure them away with the noise. <laughs> Inside the carriage, Shrike was about to act. At least let me sedate her. No. She's brought Padre plenty of pain. It's time she felt a little herself. No. The zombie was getting closer, Madison wasn't afraid of death, but the process was excruciating. She could even smell the foul stench. Just then, a hand unplugged the power socket. Get her out of here now! Seeing the guards distracted, Naomi immediately pulled out Shrike's pistol from her waist and knocked Shrike out with a single shot. She then quickly stabbed the zombie's head with a scalpel and swiftly cut the ropes. Only after these actions did she point the gun at the guards. Madison took the opportunity to push away the zombie and quickly sat up. With Naomi's cover, she exited the carriage. Naomi took down two guards with two shots. Just then, 
Shrike's walkie-talkie crackled to life with a squad asking for her location, Madison wouldn't give her that chance and kicked the walkie-talkie away. However, Shrike saw her people coming and quickly instructed Dove to contact the army. Dove was about to do so when little Morgan spoke up, saying Padre was a lie. They not only experimented on living people but also lied to us that we were abandoned by our parents. In reality, all the island's children were kidnapped by collectors. These words turned Dove's world upside down, and she didn't know whether to believe them. Madison also suddenly said, Child, I remember you. I was the one who took you to the island. You were young, but I remember you. If we can get to Padre's island and access your personal information, we can find your parents. Suddenly, the walkie-talkie came to life again with the previous squad calling continuously. In the end, Dove didn't respond. She chose to return to the island with Madison to seek the truth. As no child doesn't want to know who their parents are, Dove pointed the gun at Shrike, wanting her to lead them into the island. Given its tight security, Shrike, in a burst of emotion, said that killing her would bring unimaginable retaliation because she was Padre's daughter. This revelation left everyone in shock. They couldn't believe Shrike was Padre's daughter. That meant while other children couldn't meet their parents, Padre could keep his daughter by his side. An enormous lie. They then set off, intending to take Shrike to the island, but no sooner had they alighted from the train than a group of people emerged from the woods. All armed, these people were the like-minded individuals Adrian spoke of, parents who had lost their children. Madison then spoke up. I can't place where, but I do. And you were living in that auto yard, you ran out of food and couldn't feed your baby. And your son couldn't shake a cough, he thought he had pneumonia. She was familiar because the children were the ones Madison had taken. The woman leading the group caught a glimpse of Dove and felt a strange sense of familiarity. Diane, trying to control her emotions, asked. Where's Adrian? Naomi, with great sorrow, informed her that Adrian was dead and that his daughter had also died years ago. The group, enraged, seized their weapons and turned them around. Little Morgan tried to explain, suggesting they could expose Padre together and find the children expect us to believe that? Look, Padre's lied to all of us. I mean, this is his daughter. Maybe we can find out what else he's lied about, together. Diane, uncertain, decided to let the commander make the decision. Just then, a deep male voice came from behind. Turn around. Madison and Naomi were stunned. The commander these people spoke of was Daniel. Daniel? Madison? June. You're As an old friend, Daniel trusted them unconditionally and immediately ordered his men to return their weapons. We're gonna need them. Madison? In the last episode, Daniel and Madison were somewhat surprised and delighted to see each other alive. After all, they were among the first to meet when the apocalypse came. Now, there are hardly any old friends left. They decided to cooperate and head to Padre's Island together. On the way. Daniel briefly shared what had happened over the years. He said that seven years ago, because of Morgan, Padre discovered them at sea and took them onto a ship to assess everyone. Based on their skills and usefulness, they were assigned to different places. Everyone was dispersed. Padre thought he was too old and of no use, so they threw him into the swamp. At this point, there was a hint of sadness on Daniel's face, but he quickly continued, saying they were right about him being old. But that doesn't mean he's useless. He was just worried about Charlie who was very sick at the time. She was like his daughter. He had promised Charlie that he would stay with her until the end, but now he didn't even know where she was. Gradually, he lost his purpose and even didn't know why he was alive. Until he met these parents whose children had been taken by Padre, they were as desperate and angry as he was, so he decided to help them. Under his organization and training, they had essentially become an army, growing stronger and more numerous. He had already lost his family, Charlie and Luciana. Now. All he could do was help these people find their children, so they have been looking for Padre's island. After listening, Madison advised Daniel not to be pessimistic, because the list of people on the island not only has information about the children, but the whereabouts of Luciana and Charlie are definitely recorded. Daniel was momentarily stunned, as if he saw some hope. Then Dove called them, saying they could use the ship to get to Padre. Dove, are you sure you want to go down this road? Maybe you should stop asking questions and begin answering some. Like what? Like who else knows your Padre's daughter? Not many. How come your father separates children from their parents?
but he doesn't do the same to himself. Come on, we gotta go. Diane had been observing Dove, feeling more and more familiar. I've never seen you before in my life. Diane was a bit sad, but it could also be that Dove had forgotten about her childhood. Suddenly, voices came from behind them. These teenagers were a squad sent out by Padre. Madison thought about persuading them. After all, they were just a group of brainwashed kids. She even revealed Shrike's identity, but the teenagers couldn't make sense of it, thinking that Padre had created everything, so why should they question it? And the teenagers also threatened them if they didn't let Shrike go, they even threatened to shoot unless Shrike was released. In the end, Daniel decided to confront the youth brigade with them, Madison and Naomi took Shrike aboard as hostages. Thus, the ship set off towards Padre's island. Half an hour later, they arrived at their destination. Madison directly threatened Padre with the walkie-talkie to open the door, or they would kill Shrike. Just as she finished speaking, Daniel's voice came through the walkie-talkie, saying Diane felt Dove was her daughter. A mother's intuition, Diane was visibly excited. I didn't think it was possible. What? A mother knows. Don't fall for this crap. Your name is Alex. A collector took you from here at a campground outside Baton Rouge years ago. I think it was that woman, Lark. I'm not sure, but I'm sure about you. Alex. I've searched so long. Dove, however, looked troubled. She had no recollection of what Diane was saying. Shrike beside her told Dove not to believe Diane. It's impossible she's her mother. Stop lying to her. I'm not lying. At this point, all they needed was to get the files to understand everything. In the end, Padre agreed to Madison's demand for the safety of his daughter. all the answers you came here for. Let's go. But is everything really going to be that smooth? After a while, they were brought into a small room with the files placed on the table. However, Padre still did not show himself, remaining hidden behind a mirror. Before looking through the files, Shrike kept persuading them not to do this. She claimed everything Padre did was for the children, to prevent past events from recurring. But when Naomi and the others asked what happened, Shrike hesitated and refused to reveal it. Angered, Madison directly picked up a sledgehammer and smashed the mirror, wanting to see what Padre truly looked like. The shattered mirror revealed a room, and Madison was visibly shocked by the person inside. Shrike's father was supposed to be an older man, so why was he a young man? My father can't answer you, cause my father is dead. It turns out that when the apocalypse first erupted, the military hoarded a large amount of supplies, and the person in charge was this officer known as Padre. Padre found the small island for survivors to recuperate. Accompanied by his son and daughter, the daughter was Shrike. Back then, they were just children, and Padre was an upright officer who always took helping the people as his duty. Today, he was prepared to take the adults on the island out because a nearby dock had many containers with a vast amount of supplies. Their task was to take these items to help survivors outside established communities as that was the only hope for humanity. Senator Vasquez? We made contact with him yesterday. He and his staff are in a bunker beneath the Franklin Hotel in Galveston. They're safe. Does the Franklin Hotel they were talking about ring a bell? Alicia learned about the Padre when she was incarcerated there, but the congressman was dead. Soon Padre said goodbye to his children and boarded the ship with the others. Three hours later, they reached the port where soldiers were preparing to depart. After they all left, two figures emerged from the basement. Shrike's rebellious brother insisted on coming, so she had no choice but to accompany him. They noticed their father's telescope was forgotten. Ben excitedly picked it up to deliver it to their father, but Shrike quickly stopped him. They were already violating rules by coming out, and she worried about what would happen if Ben ran into trouble. But Ben was too disobedient, pushing Shrike aside, using an or to barricade the door, and then running towards the dock. Their father had mentioned going to the containers for supplies. Ben called out to his father as he ran, imagining being praised by him. Dad! Meanwhile, Shrike finally got free and when she reached the container, she heard Ben's cries for help along with zombies growling. Shrike rushed in to see two zombies lunging towards Ben. They're both hothouse flowers with no ability to fight and they're unarmed. What's worse, another two zombies appeared, cornering Ben into a dead end. In such a situation, Death seemed inevitable. Shrike could only stand there helplessly. Fortunately, Padre arrived just in time, 
and before he could even scold him, his son rushed into his arms, having been thoroughly frightened by the recent events. It was clear that all those soldiers had already perished, without time for discussion and with zombies closing in, they had no bullets left in their guns and had to escape from the other side, but that direction also had zombies. They looked around and found no place to hide. Were they destined to die here today? As the zombies neared, Padre thought of climbing onto the containers, he first sent his daughter up, followed by Ben, but just as the siblings tried to pull up their father, it was too late. <laughs> Don't let this die! It's so important! They could only watch as their father was torn apart by the zombies. Ben was filled with deep regret, thinking if he hadn't been so headstrong, perhaps his father would still be alive. They sat there until evening, unsure of how to face the future, but remembering their father's words. They knew they must be strong, now that all the adults were dead, revealing the truth to the children would surely cause chaos. So, they returned and claimed their parents had abandoned them, and that they must pull themselves together to survive. Since then, Ban hid behind the mirror, pretending to be their father, while Shrike managed Padre's operations outside. In a blink, over a decade had passed, newly captured children, as they grew up, were told they were abandoned by their parents and raised by Padre, everyone was taken aback. However, Madison hadn't forgotten the purpose of her visit. She pulled out the files and first searched for doves, wanting to see if Diane was indeed Dove's mother. Madison soon found it, but when she saw Dove's parents' information on it, she felt bad. Dove's mother is actually her, Ava, the woman who died seven years ago. She deserves the truth. Your name is Odessa. My name? My parents? Her name was Ava. What happened to Ava, Lark? She died. How? My mother is dead. Because of you? My mother is dead because of you! Dove! No! You made me believe in something more! Let go! Although Madison had taken the children, it was Padre's people who had killed Dove's mother. How could all the blame point towards Madison? Just because of this mistake, how did the situation reverse so suddenly? Madison and Naomi seemed to have forgotten what they came for and were taken down by Padre's men for doing nothing. Shrike handed the microphone to Madison, suggesting if she wanted to tell the truth to the people on the island, she was free to do so. Madison didn't proceed, fearing incidents like Dove's might happen again. And what if the other children's parents were also dead? Despite having the upper hand, Shrike unexpectedly took Madison and Naomi ashore with only two guards. Was this walking into a trap? Daniel and his group surrounded them, confiscating their weapons. Diane excitedly looked at Dove. Madison had failed her mission, so Daniel had to take everyone on a ship to Padre personally, leaving behind Shrike and, of course, Dove. The truth had already hurt Dove, yet she chose to stand by Padre. As Daniel and the others headed to the island, Shrike drove to the old dock. After the incident, Shrike and Ben locked up this place, along with the supplies that could help rebuild communities. Thousands of zombies perfectly protected it. Now that Daniel and the other parents were headed to Padre, they would destroy everything there. So Shrike came here again, and she contacted Ben, asking him to come here and meet with her. No one knew what Shrike was planning to do. What was it that drove Morgan, who had finally escaped from Padre's clutches, to venture alone into an even more perilous no-man's land? Amid a night swarming with zombies and flames, he desperately searches for someone. Who is this person? And can Morgan find them? Morgan escapes Padre with Madison's cover but chooses to return to where the nightmare began. In the gloomy house, the roar of zombies echoes. Morgan, mustering courage, reaches out a trembling hand to open the door but ultimately turns and flees. Overwhelmed by fear, Morgan vents his rage on nearby zombies. Just then, a car passes by, seemingly in search of something. Morgan thinks it's Padre coming to capture him but is surprised to find Grace. They had agreed to meet here. Suddenly, Morgan notices something. It's M.O. She has secretly followed Grace here. M.O. wants Morgan to lead everyone to rescue the children, but Morgan is focused solely on fulfilling his wish. It turns out that Morgan's wife had turned into zombies but he was unable to pull the trigger on her, resulting in his son being bitten by his wife. When his son was attacked, Morgan panicked and fled, abandoning his child. This has been Morgan's haunting demon for years. Now, 
Morgan chooses to return to let his wife and son rest in peace. Standing before the house, Morgan lacks even the courage to open the door. Grace and Emmo decide to face this with him. As they prepare to enter, a flare cuts through the sky, signaling that Padre's soldiers have locked onto them. Padre's leader, Shrike, suspects Morgan has come to scavenge weapons and rally troops against her. At this moment, Dwight and Sherry also arrive, intending to arrest Morgan and take him back to Padre to reclaim Finch and their freedom. Dwight discovers Grace and Emmo hiding nearby, complicating matters. Dwight and Sherry can't bear to trade Morgan for their son, but Morgan doesn't want Dwight's son to suffer Padre's retaliation for his escape. At an impasse, Morgan chooses to run, still determined to let his wife and child rest. Morgan, Grace, and Emmo flee into his home. Back in his familiar home, Morgan finds no joy, only guilt and despair. Even as Grace tries to convince Morgan to consider Moe's safety and leave, he insists on confronting his past. But Padre's forces aren't just Dwight and Sherry. Padre's people want to use flares to attract more zombies and even threaten to burn down the house to force them to come out and surrender, seeing that there is no way out. Morgan can only take Grace and Emmo to break out. However, Morgan keeps seeing his deceased wife and can't bring himself to act. Morgan is nearly incapacitated in the fight. The young Emmo is unable to fight off the zombies Grace can only get Emmo to hide inside the house. While she and Morgan are arrested by Dwight and Sherry, Shrike wants to know Morgan's true purpose here. Morgan came here merely to unravel his profound regrets. But Shrike doesn't believe it at all. Dwight and Sherry allow Morgan to fulfill his wish and prove his innocence to Shrike. They return to where Morgan's son perished. Morgan faces the zombies bursting through the door. Unexpectedly, it's not his son. Morgan breaks down. Unable to find his son and finally understanding his actions. What are you here for nothing? You will know I put you in danger for nothing. But it's too late. Shrike concludes Morgan's quest is a lie and orders his execution. As soldiers aim at Morgan, he loses all hope, silently accepting his fate. Unable to bear it any longer, Dwight and Sherry take down the soldiers. There's no turning back now. Shrike will surely target Dwight and Sherry's son to gain the upper hand. Dwight communicates with his son and instructs Finch to knock down Shrike and escape Padre by boat. Dwight and his wife hurriedly head to the pier to reunite with their son. Before leaving, Dwight still worries and encourages Morgan. Look, whatever happened here, I just know that you have a chance to make things different with Mo. Morgan remains despondent, considering himself a burden, until Grace reveals a shocking secret. Only Morgan can now save Mo. Surrounded by numerous zombies, Realizing the truth amidst his shock, Morgan accepts that the deceased are gone. He had lost his wife and son long ago. Now, his duty is to protect Grace and Emmo. Rushing home, Morgan finds the house ablaze and instructs Emmo to hide in the upper loft. Then, Morgan's wife appears again. Morgan knew that the fire behind him was too big for him to hesitate. So he finally pulled the trigger and let his wife rest in peace. In the midst of the fire, Emmo discovers Morgan's son chained in the loft. Unexpectedly, a beam collapsed and crushed Emmo. Seeing Emmo struggle helplessly as Morgan's zombified son continuously approaches to attack her. Morgan, with tears in his eyes, finally fires his gun, ending his son's life. As night fades to dawn, Morgan finally lays his wife and son to rest, with Grace and Emmo silently by his side. Now, Morgan has a new family to care for. Just as things seem to improve, Emmo was caught by a sudden zombie, and Grace is bitten while saving her. The trio just seeing the light of life, falls back into despair. Morgan immediately takes Grace and Emmo to the pier. This time, Morgan decisively eliminates Padre guards and implores Dwight's family to seek Naomi for Grace's radiation treatment. But with Padre heavily guarding the lab, can Morgan and Dwight's group escape safely? Meanwhile, Grace lies weakly on the boat, slowly opening her eyes. Morgan tells her she's been bitten, and she recalls the events. Morgan lifts up Grace's clothes and reveals a bloody wound. Emmo, seeing this, is very anxious. The family, reunited after great hardships, faces the pain of losing the mother. At this time, Padre's organization is still in hot pursuit. They are armed with submachine guns, and their firepower is extremely heavy. Dwight speeds the boat to dodge the attack. Morgan suddenly thinks of a way to save his wife. If treated promptly, Grace has a chance. So, Morgan begins negotiating with Padre. Morgan, an exceptional zombie hunter, has single-handedly killed many zombies, which Shrike values. If Morgan clears the zombies from the shipyard for her, Shrike will treat Grace and cease their pursuit. To save his family, 
Morgan has no choice but to agree and reluctantly cooperates under Shrike's threat. Grace awakens again to find herself in a truck and anxiously asks Morgan what happened. Morgan shares his cooperation with Shrike. Grace, unwilling to risk her husband and daughter's lives, strongly opposes their dangerous venture. Daniel, learning of Morgan's plan to eradicate the zombies at the shipyard, vehemently objects due to the overwhelming numbers there. Grace understands Daniel's attitude. Though Daniel is unwilling, Morgan and M.O. are determined to save Grace at all costs. Grace still doesn't want her family to risk themselves. She reveals her terminal illness to her husband and daughter, confessing that even without the bite, her days are already numbered. Grace feels that taking such a risk for someone who is about to die is not worth it. M.O. disagrees, cherishing every moment with her mother and believing they shouldn't give up any hope. Even if her mother doesn't have much time left. Shrike, learning of Morgan's ally Daniel's withdrawal, shows her cold and ruthless side. Immediately terminating the cooperation with Morgan, Shrike orders her soldiers to kill Grace to prevent her from mutating and harming M.O. and Finch. Morgan, feeling helpless in the face of soldiers armed with submachine guns, pleaded not to do that. M.O., quick to act, pushes away the gun aimed at Grace. Morgan and Dwight quickly subdue the soldiers. <laughs> They decide to split up. Morgan's group takes the water route to the train with the medical equipment, while Dwight's family takes the land route to draw fire. But the well-trained Padre forces quickly catch on to their intentions and release flares along the river to attract zombies. Seeing the danger, Morgan uses himself as a decoy to distract the enemy. Before setting off, Morgan and Grace agree to give up the treatment. Defiant M.O., unwilling to part with her mother, goes against her parents' wishes and takes her mother towards the train alone. For such a sensible daughter, what can Grace say? Her eyes are already moist. During the escape, Finch suddenly develops a high fever, previously bitten by a zombie. His wound wasn't healed in one go due to the uncontrollable radiation dosage. Dwight's group, with Finch, heads to a hidden stronghold. Shortly after they arrive, Naomi also reaches. M.O., driven by a strong desire to save her mother, miraculously brings Grace to the train using a hand-powered railcar. Despite encountering Padre's interference, but they are stopped in their tracks by Padre. After a heartfelt plea, the scouts finally let them pass, but they send up a flare, drawing zombies near the train. M.O. contacts Naomi via walkie-talkie and, with her help, begins treating Grace. While terminally ill Grace doesn't care about the radiation dose, it's just that her injuries have dragged on for too long. Shortly after saying goodbye to her daughter, Grace mutates. M.O. is pinned down by Grace who has dull eyes and blood on her teeth, and opens her mouth to attack her daughter. M.O. desperately holds her mother's jaw with one hand to avoid being bitten and reaches for a scalpel with the other. Grace turned into a zombie and was stronger than M.O. She fought to bring her mouth closer to Mo's neck, and M.O. had a hard time resisting. M.O. doesn't want to become a zombie. Just as M.O. cries out in desperation, Morgan rushes in and kills his mutated wife. M.O. is saved but loses her mother forever. That's when Shrike arrives, and she compels M.O who is full of hurt and pain. Morgan watches helplessly as his daughter is exploited. What will become of Mo's future? Morgan wakes from unconsciousness to find himself surrounded by a heap of zombies. Sometimes, his vision flashes with vivid red, realizing he has once again transformed into a zombie terminator. After transforming, Morgan can't distinguish between enemies. As long as the target is moving, it can't escape from Morgan's clutches. Madison appears beside him. It was she who knocked Morgan out trying to bring him back to his senses. But Morgan advises Madison to stay away from him. He looks at the dead zombies with utter fear. Morgan seems to have amnesia, a symptom that hasn't occurred for many years. But his wife's passing has reactivated his bloodthirsty side. To convince Madison, Morgan points to a line of words written in blood on the wall and explains emotionally that after transforming, he can't distinguish between friend and foe, and she could be putting herself in danger. However, Madison is not afraid and feels that she can help by traveling with Morgan, or at least knocking him unconscious after his transformation. She also firmly believes that with effort, she can help the lost Morgan regain his senses. Together, they set out to find M.O. Under Shrike's influence, M.O. was heading towards the shipyard. She leads Padre's remaining scouts, eliminating many zombies along the way. However, the number of zombies is overwhelming, and they keep coming. Meanwhile, Shrike contacts M.O. via walkie-talkie, Changing her strategy, she instructs Mo to find a zombie with a telescope hanging on its chest because inside the telescope lies a crucial coordinate. Morgan interrupts Shrike's instructions through the walkie-talkie, 
urging Mo not to seek death. At the same time, Morgan meets up with Daniel's team. Morgan is desperate to save his daughter but doesn't want others involved. At this moment, Madison bravely steps forward, feeling guilty for her past mistakes. She decides to help Morgan rescue his daughter. As they proceed, Morgan can't control the power within and transforms again. The group has no choice but to trap him in the marsh. Morgan wakes up to find himself surrounded by zombies and narrowly escapes. Meanwhile, Finch's vital signs stabilize under Naomi's care. But unfortunately, his days are numbered. Dwight, armed with a machine gun, prepares to confront Shrike, the understanding Naomi, who doesn't want the boy to go without his father, volunteers to help. After a strenuous effort, Morgan finally finds Amo, but his emotions are highly unstable. Seeing Morgan swinging an axe wildly, Amo, out of desperation, stabs her father with a knife. Morgan finally regains his senses but faints from excessive blood loss. Amo, with great difficulty, brings Morgan to the boathouse and seals all entrances. The number of zombies increases dramatically. Morgan wakes from unconsciousness to find one hand tied to the wall by his daughter, with the axe out of reach. Then, zombies push open the boathouse glass, and the boathouse itself is leaking. Facing the danger of sinking, father and daughter argue over past misunderstandings. At this moment, the zombie with the telescope appears. As water threatens to engulf the boathouse, Morgan instructs Mo to leave first with the oxygen equipment. Madison is on her way to rescue them. Mo, unable to persuade her father, leaves first. Madison arrives and saves Morgan from the water. Before they can react, Shrike's gun is already aimed at them. Shrike asks about the telescope's whereabouts. Morgan honestly replies it's lost. In the next second, the zombies with the binoculars on their chests showed their hideous faces from the water. Seeing this zombie, Shrike breaks down in tears. It's her father, recalling her father's kindness in her youth. Shrike can't bring herself to pull the trigger. Just like that, Shrike is bitten by her zombified father and falls unconscious. Morgan and Madison decisively eliminate the zombie and retrieve the coordinates from the telescope. Emal was confronted by the Boy Scouts, who were pointing their blackened guns at Daniel and the others. But children are still children. They can't bring themselves to pull the trigger. At this point, Morgan and Madison show up, and Morgan stops being stubborn and says to his daughter, Cause I'm letting you go, baby. Morgan promises to let his daughter do what she wants, resolving past disputes, and the allies are saved. When Shrike wakes up, she's terrified by a zombie's head and finds herself tied to the medical bed on the train by Naomi. Naomi asks Dwight what to do with Shrike. Kind-hearted Finch wants his father to let go of hatred. Ben rushes over to see Shrike and, facing his bitten sister, sheds tears of reluctance. Finally, Finch also leaves. Unable to bear the great loss of Finch, Dwight and his wife decide to leave. The departure of loved ones brings immense sorrow, but as Madison says in the film, you never lose your loved ones, their souls are with us. Morgan also prepares to find Rick, embarking on a new journey with his daughter. In the grand finale of Fear the Walking Dead, we saw Alicia. Alicia. This show is also a classic among zombie series. The final season revolves around a post-apocalyptic base named Padre and is divided into 12 episodes. The first six episodes mainly depict the conflict between other survivors and Padre. The last six episodes, however, mainly focus on the emergence of Troy, who reveals that Alicia was killed by him prompting Madison to enter a state of fury. Nick and Alicia are Madison's only relatives in this post-apocalyptic world. Madison has now met with Luciana and Daniel. Luciana now has her own organization, and Daniel has only recently joined. However, it seems they are intentionally avoiding Madison, until someone appears in the vehicle. Charlie? It's Charlie. Charlie is still alive. But Madison doesn't understand why they don't want her to meet Charlie, seeing that everyone is hiding something from her. Madison starts to question. So much time has passed, and things are no longer the same. Charlie admits she killed Nick. I killed your son. What? Upon hearing this, Madison becomes extremely agitated. But due to others intervening, Madison can't avenge Nick. She can only vent her anger by wielding a sledgehammer. Charlie says she was young and scared at the time, as people around her died because of Madison's group. 
leading her to make the mistake of killing Nick. To prove herself, Charlie decides to deal with Troy and drives a tanker truck, deliberately allowing Troy to capture her. After Troy brings Charlie back to the base, Tell him the truth. He cunningly leaves the tanker truck on the outskirts of the base, foiling Charlie's plan. At this time, the others arrive at the outskirts of Troy's base, hearing that Charlie isn't dead and has been taken hostage by Troy. Don't hurt her, Troy. So you do care about her. I wonder what Nick would think about that. He'd get it. People change, Troy. Troy keeps Charlie inside the house, threatening to kill her if anyone makes a move. Troy has only one demand, to know the exact location of Padre. He wants to destroy Padre and, like Madison, take away everything she holds dear. To protect Charlie, Madison decides to give Troy the location of Padre, and at that moment... No! Charlie! Charlie refuses to be Troy's hostage, as Padre is the place Alicia wanted to build, and it must not be destroyed by Troy. The two factions at the scene decide not to engage in combat as it would lead to heavy casualties. However, before returning to Padre, they rescue a child at the site of the tanker truck explosion, who turns out to be Troy's child. Upon learning that Tracy is Troy's child, Victor and Madison take Tracy away and start questioning where Alicia died. Since Troy killed Alicia, Madison wants to bury Alicia properly. Heard was following us when we were traveling here. He didn't want it to get near the hotel. So, when the temperature started dropping... Obediently. Tracy leads Madison to the location where Alicia and Troy had fought. Indeed, there are many zombies there, and the ground has begun to freeze, trapping the zombies' feet. They carefully navigate through the zombie horde until they come across a female zombie with a severed arm. Tracy claims this is Alicia, but after inspection, Madison realizes it's not her. At this moment, the zombies start to become agitated and slowly break out of the ice. We'll help you protect Padre. Meanwhile, Luciana's base suffers a devastating attack by Troy, leading to heavy casualties. By the time Madison returns to the scene, the battle has already ended, and during the chaos, Tracy also manages to escape from the horde of zombies. Madison! Tracy finds Troy, and they are leading a horde of zombies towards Padre because Tracy knows the location. However, on the way, they encounter an accident, and Troy is impaled by a tree branch. He orders the other squads to continue the mission, to save Troy. Tracy uses a walkie-talkie to seek Madison's help. Madison rescues Troy, as he promises to lead her to Alicia's body, but before heading out, Madison faces Troy alone. Things have changed. You have to believe me. That's just it, Troy. I don't. Madison suspects that Troy is still deceiving her. However, before dying, Troy reveals a secret. Tracy isn't his child, but Alicia's. To make up for what I lost. No! 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 And just at this instant, a notification from the exterior of Padre comes through, a fishing boat laden with zombies is already preparing to land. Thousands of zombies leap down. Close the gates! Now! Quickly surrounding Padre, Madison once again employs her past tactic. At the stadium, she did the same, luring all the zombies into the basement alone. Then, Madison releases all the flammable gas with a sledgehammer. Eventually, she enters the iron gate that once imprisoned her and ignites a flare inside. But Madison doesn't die. 
When she wakes up again, she doesn't know how many days she's been unconscious. Tracy has rescued her. Madison never expected to survive another close call. But at that moment, a familiar voice appears. Is anyone there? I'll be okay. Stop! Don't come any closer! I'm not here to hurt anyone. Keep your hands up and move slowly towards the tent. You can put the gun down. I'm just here to bury my... Mom? Alicia? After many years, mother and daughter reunite. Madison had never imagined Alicia was still alive. They sit down and slowly talk. Tracy hears a noise from the backpack. It's Daniel's little cat. This is what Daniel cares about most now. Alicia also wanted to return the cat to its rightful owner, but when Madison mentions Alicia's child, Alicia says she has no children. You're not my mom? Alicia reveals she knew Tracy's mother. This proves Troy was lying until his death, but it's understandable Troy wanted Madison to look after Tracy. Learning the truth, Madison doesn't say much. She decides to adopt Tracy. Eventually, the various factions come together. Naomi prepares to leave the team and return to where she lived before the apocalypse because her husband is also buried there. After everything they've experienced, they know some things can never be accomplished, no matter how hard they try. Dwight and Sherry also say goodbye to everyone, as they have decided to return to the Alexandria safe zone and the saviors. Yes, you heard right, they are also returning to where they started. Dwight believes they can go back and change the savior's rule, making the name truly meaningful. Daniel also seeks out Victor alone, although they've always been half-enemies. Victor initially saved Daniel and his family, otherwise, they might have died in that barber shop. So, this time, Daniel comes to express his gratitude. But as the saying goes, those who stand for different paths do not make plans together. Luciana and Daniel choose to stay, as Daniel approaches the car. His expressions and movements show how happy he is. Huh? Before Victor leaves, he sees Alicia and Madison in the rearview mirror, but he lacks the courage to say goodbye. Victor and Alicia have a very subtle relationship. A silent farewell is the most beautiful, they prepare to explore aimlessly. Madison and others stand in front of the highway, contemplating. Where? Los Angeles. We saw it kept on. It was a long time ago. Probably still pretty rough there. Probably a lot of people could use our help. It's never gonna be what it was. Yes, you heard right. Madison and Alicia continue to follow their beliefs. Even in the final season's end, they've already planned how to help strangers. This is Fear the Walking Dead which we also often refer to as the path of the saint. 